First of all, I'll say to the three students who got their awards that that's great that you got your $200 bonus. <laughs> and now if you'll just stay on for another 25 years, you can get the same bonus that I got after 25 years, $250. So stick with it, man. When I graduated in 1978, I went right up to Pennsylvania, and I went through a candidate school with my wife. And they took us to the retirement center for the China Inland Mission. In other words, all of the 30 missionaries there were from China veterans. Now, CIM, as we call it, has been kiddingly called constantly in motion. And when it became the OMF, it was CIM OMF, constantly in motion, only more frequently. <laughs> and that's what those people did. They had traveled all over China. And I know in my own case, I'm looking forward next year as you pray me to Thailand to be my 22nd move in 28 years of marriage. Uh, S-I-M-er said, well, I can beat that. S-I-M means, sure, I'll move. <laughs> we went into this room, and it was all staged for the 10 candidates that had just been going through the preparation to become OMFers. And they stood us in a row, there were 10 of us in a row, and out in the audience there were 30 CIMers. They went through, one by one, where they had worked in their ministry. And I can remember getting to about the middle of the room, and there was a man over 80 years old. And he started by saying, uh, this is my name, and I worked in, I worked in, and he turned to his wife and said, where did we work, honey? Don't you remember we worked for 10 years in China and then 20 years we were out in Taiwan, last 10 years we've been on home staff. Oh yeah, okay, now I remember. Senility was setting in a little bit, but he was able to share with us about a 50-year ministry for the Lord. We went through all 30 of them and they staged one single worker at the very back of the room and she walked right up to the front and she put her bony finger in the face of each one of us and she said, look into this room and realize that none of us were short-termers. I turned to my friend and I said, you weren't planning to be a short-termer, were you? He said, no, no, were you? <laughs> because from that point, we were ready, having seen what was presented to us hundreds of years of missionary service, we were deeply impressed with these CIMers because some of them had gone to China in the 20s, a number in the 30s. We heard stories of them going through the concentration camps with Eric Little. Some had gone through the reluctant exodus. And all of them had this unusual deep walk with God. They had the ethos of Hudson Taylor, who said, move men by prayer alone. And these 30 would get together, not once a day, but twice a day, and go before the throne and pray all through Asia and the needs there. You know, it's one thing to read about Hudson Taylor's spiritual secret. But it's another thing to see it fleshed out in the lives of people who had given their whole lives to the country of China. This morning, Let's Roll was a subject that Dr. Lawrence addressed. And it reminds me of literally hundreds of missionaries that I've met that have made that difficult decision, despite lots of, lots of opposition, to go out to the mission field. They made that difficult first step and in a thousand mile journey, that first step is often the most difficult. I've already talked to you about the Christian nurse when my wife was undergoing cancer treatment. She had a chance when she was younger to go to the field. And she was impressed with our family in the decision that we had made to just go ahead, despite those obstacles, to step out in faith. And I can say, as I look back, it has been a phenomenal privilege to look back on 25 years of ministry. I have four children, two of them in seminary, two in Bible school, and I would be very pleased if all four of them ended up being able to have the privilege that I had in ministry on the field. 
You know, the initial role that started me on this 25-year journey was sort of like the start of a roller coaster ride. And frankly, I'm not sure what the next 25 years, if God is gracious to give me that long, is going to look like. But I have people who have gone before me that have been phenomenal examples. There's a man who in 1963 graduated from this school and basically said, let's roll. Let's go to Thailand and work with tribal groups. His name was Dr. Henry Bridenthal. Dr. Henry Bridenthal was a medical doctor here around Baylor, and he started challenging young men to go to Dallas Seminary. Finally, they said, why don't you go to Dallas Seminary? So in 63, he finished his THM and he went to Thailand. He worked in the Manor Room Christian Hospital, then he went up to Laos and lived in a tribal group. 1971, he started the Bangkok Bible College. He gave up all of his medical work at that point. His theme was, no Bible, no breakfast. He is 74 years old, and he told me, Larry, in the 50 years that I've made that commitment, I have only missed that principle on about four or five occasions. I was up in a Korean village with him last year. We were sleeping in the same room. He got up a little bit late. We pushed some food on him. He said, no, I'm not going to eat. Watched him sit in the corner as he read the Word of God, and when he finished the Word of God, he joined the rest of us eating. He's the only single man in my mission. We have about a thousand missionaries that I know has stayed on the field as a single man for 40 or more years. There's a lot of women who have done these long extents on the field, but very few men. It's not that Dr. Henry did not have prospects. He had a number of prospects. But as he looked at 1 Corinthians 10, uh, at 1 Corinthians 7, he realized that he wanted to give himself without distraction to the service of the Lord. And now he is 74, still in Thailand. He's been arrested three times. Twice in China, once in Vietnam. Our mission will not allow him to return to, to Vietnam because he's such a troublemaker. <laughs> 74 years old. He's got a few more years to get to 77. He has a famous medical bag that he carries with him to this day. Now inside you'll find an old rusty stethoscope because he really hasn't practiced medicine in a long time, but it's filled with tracks. There is no human being I know of that has tracked as much as Dr. Henry Bridenthal. He has gone into a park with his team of the disciples with posters for the last 20 years. Every Sunday afternoon you'll find him in evangelism in the parks. He has the head of a scholar, but he has the heart of a genuine evangelist. He's got an MD. He almost got his PhD at Westminster. He's a man that can discuss deep philosophical Buddhism with the best of them. He keeps his Greek and his Hebrew fresh. And though he can talk to monks in the temple, he can also get down to the level of a country farmer or a tribal person with which he has worked many long hours. He does nothing without prayer. You'll go and visit him and he'll say, let's pray first. You call him on the phone, you can't get into the conversation until he prays. If you're going to travel somewhere, he always stops. He lived a simple lifestyle. Hudson Taylor lived a very similar lifestyle. He never had a car. He always took public transportation because that allowed him to rub shoulders with the tie and to get those tracks, the Word of God, which was his competence, if I can just get the Word of God into their hands. Sometimes he speaks Thai with me. He'll go on for 30 minutes talking Thai, and then he'll realize, oh, Larry speaks plausible English. I should probably speak English with Larry. He is so immersed in that culture. Medical personnel like Dr. Henry have always impressed me. In fact, I've had to use their services quite a bit. Dr. Neil Thompson is the director of OMF right now, and he was 20 years the chief surgeon at Manorham Christian Hospital. He has helped me in the one operation that I had in Thailand. I will not tell you the nature of that operation, but let's just say it had something to do with family planning. When I got to Manorum to get some of these operations and to, uh, when I was sick, I met people like Henry and Dr. Thompson, and they were helping out in leprosy clinics. There were 25 leprosy clinics spread all around central Thailand, and there were 1,400 people that were being treated. And so that was a really good opportunity to do evangelism in these skin clinics. 
But the lepers were always looked down on and discriminated against. They were called the rokitud, which means the disease of the droppings of the angels. I was doing evangelism at one of these clinics, and the thing that always impressed you was to see the nurses who had obviously their masters and some of them more kneeling down with a basin, much like Jesus before Peter, and cradling gently a gangrene limb from one of these lepers. A monk was standing next to me one time, and he looked down and he said, even the parents of this person would never touch their feet, and particularly gangrene feet. What is it that motivates these nurses? The only motivation that I can understand would be the love of Christ constraining these nurses Amen. to minister at that level. There was one CMA nurse. She would look at the lineup of lepers, and she was in charge of bandaging their, their feet particularly. And what she would do is she'd line out the easiest one at the front, and then she pro progressively go through until she had the worst case at the end. And then she learned a lot about eschatology. She would pray, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly before I have to treat the guy at the end of the line here. <laughs> that was the heart of these nurses. How can such a terrible disease as leprosy fit into the Missio Dei? How can, in God's inscrutable and mysterious will, allow there to be rokitud? I have one answer, and that is Mr. Itch. Mr. Itch was called that because he was always itching his skin. He was my co-worker in Central Thailand. We'd get on a motorcycle, we'd go into villages door to door, sleep together, eat together. Mr. Itch did not know how miserable he was, at least by American standards. He had a couple of t-shirts, lived in a little shack. I remember he had a $5 watch that he couldn't set. His glasses were always on edge like this because he had no nose. And yet he had something that I really, in counseling particularly, understood that many Americans don't have, and that he understood the secret of contentment. He had that power source, he had that joy of the Lord. And he still is working and serving God in central Thailand, and he's a trash collector. But he has this deep-seated joy in the Lord. It reminds me of the most moving scene in all of my 25 years connected to Thailand. And that was in a worship service where a very elderly leprosy man, and in his case, he didn't have even the ends of his fingers. He just had two little stumps. But he had come to Jesus Christ, and when it was time for the Lord's Supper, I watched him as he intently picked up this little plastic cup filled with this red water, and he brought it carefully to his lips. And then he got some crumbs off of the plate, and he partake, partook of the Lord's Supper. This man has passed away now, and I often have thought how that his first meal in heaven the Lord's Supper would be partaken and he could with ten perfect fingers grasp that chalice and bring it and drink it with celebration and joy. Amen. Dr. Alan Jen is, an, is another man who has said, let's roll. He was my roommate. We called it the Mosier Mansion, $250 rent. We split it five ways. They condemned our house right after we left it. <laughs> Alan was a security guard during the time that he was here. And what was exciting about Alan is he was groomed to be the pastor of his church in Sacramento. It's a Chinese church, had three congregations. He took the English part. And for 25 years, he was a senior pastor. But he did something that's very dangerous. He did a number of short terms to places like Nepal and South America. And after 25 years, he decided it's for such a time as this. I have an understanding of the pastorate and who needs to be trained in Nepal and South America? It's these nationals. He went to his wife, Bev, who is extremely close to my wife, and he said, honey, we're leaving this pastorate and we're going to go live by faith. We're going to be traveling trainers. Bev immediately grabbed the phone, called my wife. I was on the phone for hours. They still have two younger children. 
But you know, Allen could not get settled in this nice middle class, upper type suburban church in Sacramento when he was exposed to the needs on the field. He went ahead and stepped out by faith. And you know, the scriptures are replete with examples like this. But I don't want you to have to wait for God to send a seraphim to take a burning coal and place it on your lips for you to say, okay, send me. The call in the scriptures is clear. Simply reading the gospels, just sim simply reading all the various encouragements to be involved with the Great Commission is enough. Now in my case, there is a yellow band that some of you might already have seen on my arm. And you know, since I put it on about three years ago, I don't remember ever taking it off. <laughs> this yellow band reminds me of May 2002. I had worked a year to start a Bible school called the Chiang Mai Theological Seminary, and then I had the privilege of being its director for a year. My wife had had a backache for six months. We finally went into a clinic. The doctor did an x-ray, and then after an hour of looking at it, he pulled me into this little cubicle, and he pulled up an x-ray and said the words that you never want to hear, and those words were tumor. My wife was totally in shock. I grabbed her arm, I took her out to the car, I went back and paid the bill, and in those still small moments that she had, she heard a voice that said, this disease is not unto death. She went home because she understood somewhere in the Gospels it, there was that type of verse. And if you want to look at it, it's John chapter 11 and verse 4. John 11, 4, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God will be glorified. It's about the life of Lazarus. We were truly shocked at that point because the doctor said we'd have to get out of Thailand. I have four children, my wife, myself, and we had to be yanked out of Thailand in a two-week period. Left all our possessions back there in Thailand. Put my wife in a wheelchair, and then we arrived at LAX after a 24-hour trip. I arrived exhausted at midnight at my father-in-law's mobile home. We had to live there for two and a half months. And that night, I looked upon the shelf, as it would be, and I saw two books. One book was called The Problem of Pain, and I'd looked at The Problem of the Pain before in some of my studies. But there was a book that I'd never read before, and that book was A Grief Observed. The Problem of Pain is a very good biblical treatment and philosophical viewpoint of suffering from C.S. Lewis's standpoint. But as you read it, you'll realize that he is dealing in a fair amount with various theories and delving into very cognitive type teaching. A grief observed is at the heart level. He didn't want to even sign it because he was emoting the deep feelings that he had when he watched his wife, who had bone cancer, and my wife had bone cancer. He watched her slowly die, and then he wrote it all out in this book. And at midnight, I sat down with this book after a 24-hour trip, and I read the entire thing. Because the next morning, we had the hope that maybe her cancer was just isolated in one spot. The doctor gave us that hope. We were really excited about that. And then the next test showed that it was systemic. It was from her head all the way through her bone marrow system. The treatment lasted well over a year, two weeks of radiation. Our mission did not have insurance for us. I told you I was the mission of the big bucks, and so I don't know what happened. But they told me, someone said, go down to the public hospital and just go to the emergency room and see if the government will help you. I was in that mode for two weeks until they got insurance for us and we began the treatment, which included seven chemo treatments my wife's beautiful hair was lost twice. And then eventually, we had to find a match for her bone marrow transplant. She has four siblings. Three of them were not matches. One of them was a perfect match, and he lived 20, hour, uh, 20 minutes away. And so my wife, even though she can't be with us today, she is in remission. And we are believing by faith that her next biopsy will be clean. And if our next biopsy is clean next May, then we hope 
as God enables to return to Thailand. And I want to tell you, this has been a phenomenal privilege, and I enjoy speaking to you, but my heart is still in Thailand. I have not had closure. I have left things undone, as Titus said in that book written to Titus. And as you pray for us, I believe that we will be able to return. My Paula counts every day as a precious gift. And I realize that many in this room have prayed for loved ones, but there was no healing. Now, Larry, how do you explain that? I don't explain that. But I do know this, that it is all a God thing. The healing of Lazarus was for the glory of God, that the Son of God would be glorified. And I think the same thing can be said of Peter, who had said by his death he would glorify God. It's all a God thing. Our journey with cancer is not about, about my wife Paula. It's not about me, the Dinkins family. It's all about the glory of God. It's all about Jesus in his own inscrutable way, working things together for good and pushing ahead his plan that every nation and tongue will have a chance to be around that throne. Now I want to end by just talking about script writing. Now the reason I do this is I think it fits into the idea of the Maceo Day, the plan of God, because when you look at a movie, you're looking at a beginning, a middle, and an end. And God, who lives in eternity, has that chance to see the beginning all the way through till the end. And much like someone who is the writer of a script, God is the master script writer. My son Tim, two years ago, graduated from Biola University. And Tim just loves to produce films. He's done a number of short films. He even did one out in Thailand. And watching him put together a film was quite, a, quite an experience because he had low budget and basically no budget. And so you would see in the credits, producer, director, sound man. Uh, sometimes he would take the pictures. He acted in his own films. But the thing that always struck me, he loves screen, screenwriting and script writing, and he would always put those scripts together, much like we saw this week, all that went in, and all the different takes, because in a movie you have that luxury, if the first take doesn't work, then you can do take number two, three. I've seen him take up to seven takes until he got it just perfect. I've often thought, what if I could write my script? And the script would be, the Dinkins family glorifies God in Thailand. Well, my script would read like this, I'd go to Bangkok, I'd study language, but I'd be such a great student, I'd finish in six months. And then I'd identify a tribal group in North Thailand that had never been reached. I would move there with my family, and then I would start to translate the scriptures. When I got them translated, I would begin to be an evangelist and go from village to village and see revival and sparks of God's fire move within that tribal group. And then from Thailand, I would see it move into Burma, into China, into Laos. And then when I'm about my age now, 50 or so years old, and all of the nationals had taken over my work and I could exit out of there, I'd come back to Dallas Theological Seminary for my dream job. And I think I'd teach missions for around 10 years, and then at 65, I'd buy a house like Ted Dibler did out there at Lake Ray Hubbard, and like Ted Dibler, I'd pay, play golf every day. Now, would that script glorify God? You know, that type of script could obviously glorify God. But in the end, it looks more like a script that would glorify who? It would glorify the Dinkins family. You see, God diverted from the script that I had written. He wrote in a number of nice high points, but he wrote in a number of valleys as well, like robbery and sickness and various discouragements. Why did he write a script like that? It's because he has the eternal viewpoint of the whole movie. And he is the ultimate script writer. My script indeed would bring glory to me, but God's script, the Missio Dei that he planned from before the foundation of the world, it brings glory to the entire Trinity, to the whole Godhead. How different our Bible would read if the actors got to write their own script. Think about Ruth. I think Ruth would have stayed in Bethlehem with her husband and her two sons. She died in a ripe old age but we never know about her. God diverted from Bethlehem, the house of bread, and moved her to Moab, where the three men in her family died, and then she comes back as Mara, bitter, 
with a pagan daughter-in-law. And yet, as God wrote that script, at the very final scene, what happens? There's resolution. Because on Naomi Pleasant's lap, there's Obed, who is in the lineage of the great King David and ultimately the Messiah. What about Lazarus? Mary and Martha would have never written a script where their older brother gets sick. But it's for the glory of God that the Son of God would be glorified. How about Johnny? If Johnny at 16 years old could write her script for the day she was out at the ocean and diving into the water, I think she would have just adjusted it a few degrees because she dove in at the wrong angle at 16 years old. 40 years later, she's still in a wheelchair. But in the script that God in an inscrutable providence and sovereignty allowed to happen, each one of us have been impacted by Johnny Erickson Tata. And I personally am challenged constantly when I think of her in her wheelchair anytime I start to complain about anything. How about Tom? Is Tom here today? Tom Inglesman? Where are you, Tom? Raise up your hand. He's not here today? Okay, he went home to be with his wife. Tom was sharing about how, in a very similar way to me, he was yanked off the field because his son had cancer and only about two years old, one year old. And just a day or so ago, he got word that his son had broken his leg, his femur, at three years old. Imagine if Tom had the chance to write the script for his family. He would have written it different. But the movie is not over for Tom. It's not over for me. And God has an unusual way as that chessman moving the pieces around in order to bring glory to himself. The best book that I've ever read during these four years that we've been home is called Shattered Dreams by Larry Kraft, Shattered Dreams. I would encourage you to get this book. Paula's cancer dashed my hopes of being the director of the Chiang Mai Theological Seminary. I spent a lot of time getting that school going. I felt like that was my niche for the next 20 years of ministry in Thailand. God diverted from that script. And later, the director of the Bible school that took over for me, he changed the name of the school, but he didn't tell me. I thought, you know what? I'm not that indispensable to God's work. And none of us are indispensable to God's work. But he graciously allows us to partner with him and to cooperate with him and have the great joy of getting on waves and momentums of church planning that bring hundreds, maybe thousands, into the kingdom. So I'd just like to end us with you, maybe pausing with your head bowed and your eyes closed, and just do a little meditation on your own script. First of all, I'd just like you to briefly think about whatever script that you might have been writing for yourself. You know, the scripture says, I will give you the desires of your heart. And there is nothing wrong with asking God to write a script that you feel is honoring to him. But my question is, are you willing, as a person who's thinking about being a pastor, about someone who's thinking about being an evangelist, a teacher, to allow God to divert from whatever script you might have? My brother Tom Constable told me just recently that he doesn't sign for the next year until he gets through the WEC conference because he knows that God has the right to divert his script in any direction he wants to go. And he's willing, he's ready for any diversion that God might bring. And so you place before God this script. You place before God whatever plans you might have and you hold them with a loose hand and you say, God, use this script to bring the greatest and maximum glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you willing to let God write your script? Are you willing to stretch yourself? Abba, Daddy, we just realize that you are indeed the script writer. 
you have every right to guide and direct our lives. And Father, help us to be obedient as actors in this great play, the Missio Dei, that we would involve fully, that we would learn our parts well. And then when we find a part that's difficult, Lord Jesus, help us to go ahead and live that out, even if it causes suffering, even if it causes problems. Because, Father, we really want to glorify your Son. We want to glorify the entire Godhead in all its facets. And we want your name to be the name of renown. We think of the name of Buddha, Muhammad. We think of the name of Krishna. And it saddens us when we think of how famous those names are. We want your name to be that name above all names, a king above all kings, and Lord above all lords. So use us, Lord, in that Missio Dei. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.